see that why P's choose differently, we've now, we actually just totaled it up last week. We have over 32,000 interviews, surveys, and focus groups with the next generation. But here's what they say, right? They say live first, work second. This is the title of the new book that just came out in October. Here are the statistics. Half of all 20 to 40 year olds say that where I live is as important as where I work. That number goes up to 75% when they're under the age of 28. So as you're thinking about bringing new talent into your organization, especially if you're thinking about bringing them from outside of Milwaukee, you know that yes, you have to sell the value proposition of your organization, but you also have to sell Milwaukee. The next thing we know about the next generation is that they fancy themselves, especially the older 20 to 40 year olds, those who are about 32 and up, as free agents, right? Gen Xers were the first generation of latchkey kids. They were left on their own after school, and they were, and furthermore, the guidance counselor came in in the second grade and taught the stranger danger curriculum. Right? Don't talk to strangers, don't take candy from people. This is when the whole urban myth about um, razor blades and Halloween candy started. I mean, the next generation was taught to like look at strangers like, oh! So when you think about this in the workplace, is it any wonder that like when you bring members of the next generation onto your team and you're like, hey, you know, we're gonna be buddies, especially for baby boomers. Baby boomers, you are like the kumbaya generation. You're like, I want to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. You invented all of the team building exercises and created demand for, throw yourself off a tree, we'll catch you. You guys invented all that stuff, right? <laughs> because for the baby boomer generation, membership and affiliation is really important, right? And that's great. But for the next generation, who was ranged with stranger danger curriculum, when you're like, hey, let's go together and play, go bowling. You want to join our bowling team? They're like, ah, strangers, right? <laughs> so it creates this expectation on the part of boomers sometimes that extras just can't pull up to because they think of themselves as free agents. They were taught not to trust anybody. But the statistics bear this out as well. Time Magazine reported that by the time they're 32 years old, the next generation has had nine jobs. This would, if my dad wasn't already dead, he would die reading this slide. He'd worked for 33 years in a row for the same company. He's so last generation, right? This just doesn't happen anymore. And sometimes people say, Rebecca, I need you to come in here and make the next generation loyal. It's impossible. It's impossible to do that. But it's not because the next generation is some weird, freaked out, skeptical, angry generation. It's because for the next generation, they came home one night after school and their parents announced at dinner that dad had lost his job. In 1983, AT&T announced it was laying off 10,000 people. By the end of the 80s, over 3 million people had lost their jobs. This was the first time this had ever happened in our country, and it cut a gash in America's security blanket that we have still not recovered from. So when you think about why the next generation is free agent-like, some of it is because they learned at the dinner table as kids that there is no loyalty, right? So they come in and say, asking, what's in it for me, right? What am I gonna get out of this? The final statistic here about being free agents is how many of them start their own, job, their own workplaces. They don't like how it's working with you, they'll just spin off and start their own thing, right? Not very risk averse, very entrepreneurial, Gen Xers, women, and people of color. The next thing you know this, this next generation is tech savvy. I mean, anymore, you need a website developed, find a four year old. Like, they can get that thing cranked out in no time flat. <laughs> Have you, I mean, some of the brain science now is pretty amazing when you set a two or a three year old in front of the computer, they get the mouse like that. It's like they have a little chip embedded when they come out, right? And when Keith was talking about text messaging and his daughters, it reminded me of the Pew research that's been done that shows that in the workplace, there are two kinds of people. There are digital natives, the people who text message while driving. They don't even have to look at their phone anymore to do it, right? 
They have been diagnosed with nintendinitis. I swear to God, the Journal of the American Medical Association has now called it nintendinitis. It's a repetitive stress injury that happens in the thumbs and goes up through, the, somebody's stretching right now, like, oh my God, I, that's what I have? Um, <laughs> right? So you've got digital natives, and then you've got digital immigrants, right? People for whom, right, we've, we, people in our office, we have both in our office, and one of our digital immigrants, somebody who, for whom technology is not native, when she worked in a Windows environment, she always said, I don't understand why I have to go to the start menu after the computer has already started. I mean, it's kind of a good question, right, for a digital immigrant. So the technology divide that you sometimes sense in your organization comes down to this issue. 30 is the new 20. Listen, adulthood is being pushed back for the next generation. Here are the statistics in the United States. 28 and 26, average ages of a first marriage. Can anybody like, give me an amen that this has happened in their family? Like their kid has waited until the late, their late 20s to get married? Or they are that kid? Okay, yeah. So for any of you who have like a 22-year-old and you're already starting to breathe down her or his neck about, when are you going to get married? Settle down, Snowy. It's going to be a while. <laughs> the other thing that I have to say about this next generation in marriage is that a lot of these marriages are starter marriages. It's true. I mean, have, I had one. And it was like this. It was like, um, have you ever bought a new car? Right? You drive it off the lot, and then like a month later, you're like, Boo, I should have gotten the sunroof. <laughs> it's it's kind of like that with some first marriages. You know, you're in it for about a year, a year and a half. Nobody teaches you how to be a good partner in marriage, right? So you drive it around for a little while, you're like, not my model. I need, a, I need an upgrade, right? Or whatever the case is. So then, by the time the next generation really is getting married and settling down, they're not even having kids first. What are they having? Pets! That's right! So, you know, when we come in and um, help communities figure out what it's going to take to attract and retain the next generation, one of the first questions we'll ask is, where are your dog parks? Right? Because those are like kid parks used to be in the 50s and 60s, dog parks, right? So the average age for a first marriage is being pushed back. And finally, this next generation is super skeptical. This is my favorite statistic. <laughs> and some of you are like, I'm in there, man. I'm in there with them. I believe the same thing. So this component, this portion of thinking about the next generation, right? If you look at your workplace through the lens of the next generation, how does it look? <laughs>